Well, what's up, guys? I'm excited to be diving into this new series on spiritual warfare and what does that mean and what does it all entail for us? And we're going to be in um, the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20 for the next three weeks. So we're going to be doing a deep dive into these verses and how they apply to us in spiritual battles that we face. And so to kind of set up really the entire series, um, who here, as you're turning to Ephesians 6, who here, uh, you at one point in your life or another had or have a bully? Raise of hands, raise of hands. Okay, okay. So, so in elementary school, I had a bully, and uh, I remember he was like, I, I remember how we got into the fight, but I do remember that he wanted to fight me, and um, when I say fight, I mean he hit me, and I hit the ground. And so, uh, I mean, he hit me so hard, um, and, uh, and um, man, I just, I still remember being like, I'm normally like an aggressive guy, like whenever I was little and I was used to like being that kind of dude, but uh, I was scared of this guy. Well, um, fast forward to, um, that, that's in elementary school, fast forward to middle school, um, this same guy um, was, he had the middle school girlfriend uh, and his girlfriend broke up with him because she liked me. And, and I was like, hey, don't hate me because you ain't me, and, 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 but but this guy, he wanted to fight me again. And so he walks up. And it's like the movie scene. He walks up. I'm at the locker. Um, and then he's like standing right there. And uh, he's like, hey, you know that me and you, we got to handle business. Except he maybe he said it in other words. And, uh, and I'm like scared to death. I'm like, this guy's about to fight me. Now he's known as a really good fighter still. Um, and uh, and my, my social studies teacher walks over and is like, hey, leave him alone. And I was like, yeah, leave me alone. And uh and so after school, I literally, I'm chopping. I run home as fast as I can um, to get away from this, this bully that's wanting to fight me. Well, uh, news has started to spread that he wanted to beat me up. And uh, anyway, I was at my house, and I was talking with some, some of my friends about how this guy wanted to fight me. He planned on really fighting me um, before I got to get away the next day. And my brother overheard this conversation. And uh, my brother, uh, he's four and a half years older than me. He was a superstar athlete in high school at this time. And, uh, and he walks over as we're talking about this kid wanting to beat me up. And he goes, hey, what time do you get out of school? And so I tell him what time I get out of school. And he's like, okay. And he walks away. And I was like, that's kind of weird. Well, the next day, the whole school, like the, at least the people that I know, knew that this kid wants to fight me and beat me up. And so I'm like standing out there. There's like the classic half circle of people just kind of standing there waiting to see if Travis is going to get beat up or not. Um, and I was like, I'm just going to take it. At least I'm going to go out uh, swinging. Um, and, uh, and this kid shows up and I'm like, he's going to beat me up again. Uh, and, and it's about that time as he's walking out that I see out of the corner of my eye as I'm terrified my brother walking up. So my brother had just gotten out of football. He had like the cutoff on um, and he walked up. He's like 6'3". Um, he walks up um, and, uh, and man, the, the shift of confidence that happened in that moment. Like all of a sudden I was like scared and then, my, then Richard comes up and he's standing like right beside me and, and this guy, we'll call him uh, Justin because that's what his name is. And, uh, and, and he walks up to want to fight me and... And all of a sudden, I go from terrified to so confident. Like, I'm just in this moment like, what's up? What, you want some of this? I'm like, Richard, hold me back. That's my brother's name. Hold me, hold me back, Richard. Uh, and man, the confidence was just there because my brother showed up. Now, how does that apply to us in spiritual warfare? Well, Josh really said it as he was praying us into this moment, but we are in a spiritual fight. There is a battle coming against every single person in this room, but Jesus, he shows up to empower us and help us. And over the next few weeks, tonight we're going to talk about the preparation of being prepared for that fight. And then we're going to talk about the spiritual defense and offense of our faith over the next um, two weeks after that. And so tonight we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 14. And so if you feel like, oh man, I feel like we kind of ended in the middle of something, it's because we did. And so um, come back for the next couple weeks to, to get the full picture of what spiritual battle is and how we go about defeating the enemy. But let's look at it together, starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the day of evil or the evil day. And having done all to stand firm. And then verse 14, those first two words, stand therefore. So a lot to unpack together. And this is, by the way, a note taker's sermon. Um, so I hope that you're ready to take lots of notes as we, uh, one person on the front said, yes. Um, so we've got one. And so um, the, there's a lot of information for us to go through. But man, I hope that this not only informative for us tonight, but transformative um, as we go through this. But the first point this evening is this. There is a battle plan against God's people. There's a battle plan against God's people. And so we see this. If you look at, we're going to come back to verse 10 at the end of the sermon tonight. But it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. That word schemes is the Greek word methodia. And so um, it, it means deceit or craft or trickery or scheme or strategy. So it's just kind of this robust word that means so many different things. And so um, it means but partly to be deceived or to deceive somebody or to trick someone. I think it's so crucial that we go through this series together. And a key reason we want to spend three weeks on this series is because a lot of people don't even realize that they're in a spiritual battle. And one of, I think one of the greatest ways the enemy defeats us is by convincing us that we're not actually in a fight. But we are. And, and a lot of people are deceived and thinking they're not. But man, we are facing a real battle. And there is an enemy strategizing against us, which is what this word means, that he's scheming or strategizing. And I think about whenever I was in athletics and we would watch game film on another team for hours to see specific tells on plays that they're about to run, to watch specific individuals and their tendencies, or to try to get any kind of a, a way to know how we can go against them and how we can ultimately defeat them. I say that because spiritually, I believe that there is an enemy who's watching game film on your life. There is an enemy that actually is watching to know your tendencies and is thinking about how to defeat you. Now, just to get personal from the very beginning of this message this evening, let me ask you a question. If the enemy was going to take you out, do you know how he would do it? Because he does. He, he knows how to take us out. He knows the places that he would want to hurt us. Like, do you know where the enemy would want to hurt you? So for me, I talk about how, man, I'm trying to live this, this new legacy of faith because of Jesus and what he's done in my life. And a new legacy of Jesus and a family that has a legacy of Jesus as we are imparting faith into our children. And man, as I think about that, I think about how the enemy wants nothing more than to put that to a stop because he hates godly families. And he hates generational chains being broken. He, he does not want that to happen. So how would he come against me? Well, how did he go against my dad? My dad fell into alcoholism. And I know the enemy would want nothing more than to play the card that was played against my dad against me. So when it comes to the issue of alcohol, I need to have some measures put in place for me, some healthy boundaries when it comes to that subject in my life because I just don't want to fall in that way or in that area of my life. Another thing, like, uh, I, I know that to be present with my family and to really disciple my children, I know that requires that I'm present. And it hit me a couple years ago that, listen, it might not be alcoholism, but it could be workaholism that keeps me from being the dad and the husband um, and the family man raising of ch children that know Jesus, that I want to do that. Um, and I, I know that, the, that workaholism kind of works against that, but to me it was no, like, crazy sin, you know? But I had to realize that I can still give the same issues and still pass down chains of hurt to my family if I'm not present, if I'm present for everybody else, discipling everyone else except for my own family. 
And it's been said that if the devil can't make you bad, he will make you busy. I don't know if you've heard that, but I think there's a lot of truth to that statement. And so I got to make sure that I have some, some healthy rhythms in place in my life. And, so, and I got to prioritize certain people in my life to make sure that the enemy can't take me out that way. Now that's me. What about you? What are places in your life that the enemy would want to come against you? You got to realize that you are in a spiritual battle. And then you got to think about measures that you need to take to protect yourself against the schemes that you know would be drawn up against you. So there is a battle plan against you and against me. And that battle plan comes from a very specific source. It says, the schemes of the devil. Now, the next point this evening is this, preparing for battle requires knowing who you are fighting. Preparing requires knowing who you are fighting. It says that, we are, that the, the devil is scheming against us. Now, not only can the devil watch game film on us, going to that metaphor, we can watch game film on the devil and learn certain things. And so that's what I want to do over the next several moments together. And so we're going to rapid fire through a lot of information over the next several minutes together. And again, this is where maybe the hands can be jotting some stuff down. And don't try to turn to the verses because I'm going to be going as fast as I possibly can for time's sake. So um, if you are ready, say I'm ready. ready. If you're not ready, say I'm ready. Okay. Um, and so, and so we, what, what do we need to know about Satan? Well, Satan is not this red guy with a pitchfork that shows up and poofs on someone's shoulder. Um, and then there's an angel and they kind of figure out who's going to win, the devil or the angel. Like that's all just in pop culture and cartoons that we've seen growing up. That's not the picture that the Bible gives of Satan. And so what's some rapid fire theology that we can learn about Satan in the demonic realm as we can study and watch game film? One, who is Satan? Uh, Satan is the angelic enemy of God who rebelled against God. And so Satan and other angels that he was leading who joined him were cast out of heaven. Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus is speaking and he says, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I saw Satan fall. So he was cast out of heaven. Now, I want to stop here and say, I know that we are in a culture that we do not think about the spiritual realm or talk about angels, demons, and that kind of thing, just culturally speaking, like on a regular basis. Um, and so there's all kinds of weird thoughts that are permeating culture right now, uh, and maybe even your own mind. Uh, and I think there's a couple of places in a, that people fall and a couple errors that people make. Um, C.S. Lewis said it like this when it comes to a couple of the mistakes people make. When it comes to Satan and demons, he said there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. And so he says there, there's two categories that people fall into. Some disbelieve and some they have obsession. And none of them, neither of those are healthy. So let's talk about them. Let's talk to the person that has disbelief. Uh, if, if someone was skeptic, or maybe you've been here tonight and you're going like, ah, oh, this sounds weird to me. You know, like I feel like we need to wear tinfoil hats right now and, uh, and like a little bit cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs over here, you know, kind of kooky. Um, I, I would just say, hey, uh, for the person that's truly skeptical of this kind of thing, I would say, would you just consider some of these things I'm about to say? Consider the satanic imagery that's in our culture. Like everything from, and this was kind of weird, but I did watch the, the video. Everything from Lil Nas twerking on Satan, that was awkward, um, to Travis Scott and the demonic imagery that he has at his concerts to the really popular um, and pretty controversial Grammy performance by Sam Smith um, that had all kinds of demonic and satanic imagery attached to it. Um, and I know right here, a lot of people are gonna pause and go, come on, Travis, are you serious? It's because people want to, they're just, it's all shock factor. If you talk about it, then their name gets mentioned more and the dollars start to roll in. You know this, right? And I would say, I think that's true. And maybe you have something there, but let me continue. Um, so not only that, but uh, I'll take like, for instance, C.J. Stroud. 
quarterback for Houston Texans. Um, he was in an interview during the playoffs, and it was about a one-minute clip of an interview, and they normally don't edit those interviews at all. That's not a normal thing for them to do, but they did edit his interview in the playoffs. You know what they edited out? I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We got to at least ask why. Not only that, because again, you're like, okay, well, that seems like an isolated instance. So I was actually on Instagram myself, and I saw something that said, uh, that flagged this video as inappropriate, but in the description, it was talking about Jesus. So I, I watched the video, and the thing that they flagged as sensitive for many eyes and inappropriate for some people, it was a news, um, it was uh, on the news, and it was this news story about a bunch of football players who had put their faith in Jesus and they were baptized by their coach. Flagged as inappropriate. Interesting. Um, I, I don't know if you knew this, but at our White House this last weekend on Easter, they removed all religious imagery, uh, imagery from Easter. So, and, they, and they decided to celebrate something else that day. So no Jesus on Easter, which that's what Easter is all about, especially speaking to America, um, is, man, we, Christians celebrate the resurrection of their Savior. They remove that. At least would you say that's interesting? Like, it could just be all coincidence, and there's nothing to be made of it, or 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 could be true. 1 John 5, 19 says this, that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That there's an actual spiritual bondage that is over this world. Now that's one side of the coin, disbelief. The other side of the coin would be obsession, right? This is like everything's the devil, you know? Um, this is like, you know, you, uh, you wake up late for class and you didn't hear your alarm and you're like, ah, oh, the devil got me again. And it's like, no, bro, you stayed up till 3 a.m., um, but if you want to blame shift on the Satan, I guess that is an option. Um, you know, you hit a nail and, and your tire pops, you know, like, dang it, Satan. And it's like, I don't know. I don't know that that was Satan. That could have been a construction worker. I'm not sure. Uh, but, uh, um, and, uh, you know, like you eat food and it's, uh, you get food poisoning and, and, you know, you feel like demons are coming out of you. But, uh, you know, I'm not saying that that was actually a demon coming at you. And so, uh, you know, I think obsession and unhealthy obsession is an error that some people have. We don't want to fall into either of those categories. So what are some key truths just that will draw boundaries for us as we try to look at game film and study our enemy? Well, one, Satan, and this is just Christianity 101, Satan is not as powerful as God. Satan is not as powerful as as God. So some of us, we get this picture when we think of Satan and Jesus. They're like in this massive grudge match and like, by the way, both of them are jacked. Well, obviously you can see that J uh, Satan is jacked and Jesus is just not showing you his guns because he's humble. And so, um, but, but we think about this gridlock match and we don't know who's going to win. Is evil going to win? Is light going to win? Is dark going to win? Is, I, I don't know. I don't know. Is evil or good going to win? We, we just don't know. Well, that's actually not true. That's not what scripture says. Um, here's a better picture of what happens in scripture. Um, like, he, Jesus wins, man. Jesus, uh, that, you can call it a Jesus juke. And so he, he wins against the enemy. And one, one passage to describe this would be Matthew 4. Whenever Jesus is being tempted by Satan, it says, Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and shall only, serve, only him shall you serve. And it says this, then the devil left him. It doesn't say the devil bowed his chest up at him. It didn't say the devil said, arm wrestle you for it. Um, it didn't say that I'm going to fight you right now. No, he said, yes, sir. And he left. Because that's what he has to do. Because Satan is fearful of God. Like Satan knows his place. He knows he cannot win. The next truth within that, um, it, it says he left because he isn't there anymore. And so that brings us to the next truth of him not being there anymore because Satan is not like God. He is not omnipresent. Satan is not omnipresent. So I wanna say this, because a lot of times we say Satan's attacking me or I, th that kind of a thing. And when we say that, I think we're saying that just a demonic presence, an evil presence, I feel like is coming against me. Um, but most likely, no one in this room will actually battle Satan himself. 
Like, I do believe that there's a spiritual opposition and there are demonic, uh, there is demonic oppression for Christians, but most likely we'll never battle Satan because Satan is not omnipresent. Um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says this. It says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So he prowls around, meaning he's not everywhere. He's not everywhere. And where does he prowl around is the next question I want to answer. He prowls around on the earth. And this is a, a, just a did you know um, that I think a lot of people didn't know. Hell is not the kingdom of Satan. So hell is not the kingdom of Satan. A lot of us are like, what? I thought it was. Uh, hell was actually created to ultimately throw Satan and the demons into as their punishment. So 20, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, we see this very clearly. It says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for who? The devil and his angels. So hell was actually created to throw Satan into as his punishment. Now, like you could say that's some uh, fire truth right there. Uh, you see what I did there? Just just my opportunity at a lit dad joke. Um, that was one hell of a pun though. Um, moving on. Um, so, so Satan does not rule the kingdom. So, so hell is not ruled and it's not Satan's kingdom. Um, but he does prowl around on earth for now. And there is a limited authority that he does have, as we already read in one of the passages, which brings us to the next point, kind of rapid firing some theology for us. Satan has limited authority over the earth until his judgment day. Satan has limited authority over the earth until his judgment day. Where do we see this? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 is one of the places. It says, in which you once walked, following, talking about all of us, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And so it calls him the prince of the power of the air. So there's a certain amount of authority that he is given um, right now, and he is working in this world as the prince. It says prince, and that's why we see limited authority, because he is not the king. Like Jesus is still king. Jesus is still the one who reigns ultimately, but there is, there is a real enemy. And he wants to use all of his authority for one thing, and it's to hurt God by hurting us. Satan wants to hurt us. Why? Because Satan hurts, or Satan wants to hurt us because Satan hates God. And since he can't defeat God, he'll go after who God loves, you and me. And maybe you're here, and just like you heard from Kobe's story, the message you need to hear tonight is there is a God who actually does love you and will meet you right where you are at tonight, um, which is such a powerful thing. But he hates God, so he goes after us. And so there, because of that, there is a battle that we all must fight. But in this fight, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 is so key. It says this, little children, you are from God and you have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Powerful truth. So a couple things from that. One, you can fight back. You can fight back against the spiritual forces coming against you. Like some people I've talked with and they'll ask questions like, man, can Satan like step in and just make me do something? Like Satan took over and he made me do that. Um, I would say as a Christian, Satan cannot make you do anything. And so um, let me be more clear. Some people have asked, like, can Satan, like, possess a Christian? And I would say, no, Satan cannot possess a Christian based on this verse and many others. But he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I'm property of Jesus, and Satan cannot occupy that. And that's true for anybody who is a believer. So you can fight back, and it's a battle that you can win. But at the same time, third, it's a battle that you do have to fight. It's a battle you do have to fight. But we have Christ with us, and because of that, we have confidence going into the fight. But simply put, the next point is this, as we go back to Ephesians 6, faith is a fight. Faith is a fight. 
Look at verse 12. It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so it says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This word wrestle is a really interesting word. It's the Greek word pale. Um, and they would actually, the Greeks had, had basically gladiator stadiums that, and they called them palestras. And it's from this word, derived from this word right here. At palestras, they would, they would box and they would wrestle and they would fight, but it's not the way that we see in UFC or um, a boxing ring today. No, they, they, they don't have uh, padded gloves. They would actually wear gloves that were metal studded so it would hurt more. And often, often in this hand-to-hand -hand combat, people would die in the ring. This is the word that he's trying to use to convey to us the spiritual battle that you and I face. So maybe you're going, so how can I know if like, that's pretty intense. How can I know if I'm in a spiritual battle? I just want to ask the question from this passage. I would say, well, are you wrestling? If you are deeply wrestling, then there is a spiritual component to that. Now, let me be clear. So I, uh, so I, I've shared many times, I have the social anxiety disorder and uh, get panic attacks and all this stuff whenever I'm not in a good place. And, and man, I, uh, there, have been, there have been times that have been a deep struggle for me. I've talked about that a lot. Um, so I take medicine for that. And, uh, and if you were to ask, okay, so, so you're saying, so that's a struggle. Sounds like you're wrestling. I would say, absolutely. Do I think that the disorder itself is demonic? Well, no, not, not, not really. But at the same reason I say not really is because at the same time, there have been times that I've struggled to the point to where I was tempted to walk away from all of this and no longer preach God's word, even though he clearly called me to, um, because, man, it was such a struggle. And being up here is it, sometimes a real battle for me. Do I believe that there is a spiritual attack component to that battle? Absolutely there is. Does that make sense? So I'm not saying that every single struggle, it's all demonic, but I'm saying there is a spiritual battle within that. And so, and so to make it even more clear, either at the end of the day, as a Christian, our battle is a spiritual one. So if you are wrestling inwardly, then there is a component of spiritual warfare going on there, either directly, meaning there's actually a spiritual demon or, and demonic realm coming at you, or indirectly, meaning, man, you're really struggling and it wasn't directly from Satan, but it pulled you away from God. And since it pulled you away from God, then Satan will write that down into the W column. Does that make sense? So in, that's in an indirect way, still a spiritual battle is going on. There is a component of spiritual battle every single time that we are wrestling. And some of us in here, we have never, ever called any of our wrestlings spiritual. It's always something else. We're willing to call it everything else, but what if it's actually a spiritual battle? What if that's the place where God wants to speak to you tonight? Because there's people, man, like just by raise of hands, if at some point in your life you would say, I've had a battle raging within me, will you raise your hand if that's true for you? That's pretty much all of us. See, there's this, this spiritual battle coming against all of us. At the end of the day, our fight, it's a spiritual one. This is really unique for the Christian perspective in a couple of ways. One, it's really unique because, again, we can speak Jesus over our spiritual battles. Like Jesus can speak peace and be peace in the middle of the raging battle that goes on inside of us. Jesus shows up and he can bring peace to it. And that's a powerful, powerful thing that I've seen take place in my own life. And it can happen for you tonight if you are in a battle even right here, right now. But secondly, it's a really unique perspective because we are recognizing that we're in a spiritual battle, but we are physical people in a physical world with other physical people all around us. And in our culture today, there is a lot of, like I've heard it said so many times, we're more divided today than ever in our lifetime. Just as a culture. There's a lot of us versus them, a lot of me versus you. 
but we are recognizing that actually our battle isn't against flesh and blood. That's what this says. It says that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against the spiritual forces at work in this world. And he's saying this because of this, and this is our next point. He wants to make sure that we're fighting the right battle. As we're preparing for battle, we got to make sure we're going into the right fight. And we don't battle against flesh and blood. And now he says that line, if you just read the entirety of the book of Ephesians, what you would have read before you read we don't battle against flesh and blood, is if you you would have read um, in the immediate verses before this a passage about wives and husbands and how uh, marriage is to function to the glory of God. Uh, You would have read about children and parents and how that relationship is to function in a godly way. And then you would have read about um, employees and employers and how we are to function at work in a godly way. Talking about all these different dynamics of human relationships that we have, right? And he's gonna go, listen, I know that there's tension within some of those. I know that there's really difficult things that have happened within some of those, but at the end of the day, your fight's not against people. Matter of fact, as Christians, we fight for people, not against them. For so long, man, the church has been known for only what it is against and who it is against. Hey man, we are, we are for human, humanity. We love humanity because Jesus loves humanity and wants to, wants to change this world and is changing the world one person at a time, one life at a time. But for a long time, the church has been just known for what it's against and he's saying don't, don't fight That battle, don't fight the battle of just being against people. No, what if you fight the battle of showing the love of Jesus to this world? And that doesn't mean that you never stand on truth that's countercultural or anything like that. Doesn't mean that you'll never have opposition. Actually, that's promised to us as well. But it just means that we want to make sure that we're not fighting against people. We're fighting for the kingdom of God spreading to people. Division, division is a key tactic of Satan. Some of us, Like maybe you're here and you have a lot of animosity and bitterness built up towards someone. And that's what Satan wants is a lot of us versus them, a lot of me versus you. But Jesus wants something else and wants us to realize we're not battling against flesh and blood. So what does this look like? Just bringing it down to us right here, right now in college with your roommates how many of y'all have had or do have a messy roommate? Okay. How many of y'all are next to him? No, I'm joking. Don't, don't. <laughs> How many of y'all have had the conversation uh, of the, uh, the, the dishes in the sink? And you go, hey, you know, you remember that conversation where we said, like, we're going we're gonna to get the dishes. And you're like, hey, it's no big deal. But bro, like, hey, just get your dishes. No big deal. No big deal. And they're like, totally. They're going to be gone tomorrow. And then you wake up tomorrow. And the dishes are still in the sink. Had that moment? And not only that, you see the dishes in the sink and you see a little cockroach go by. And you're like, I got to talk to him. And, and this passage is not telling you, and it's not instructing you that you would talk to your roommate and go, hey, so I was at church this weekend. Uh, crazy, crazy talk. Uh, listen, it's really not your fault, but I think that you're the devil incarnate. Because I don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but man, I'm wrestling. That's not what this is saying. This isn't saying that your roommate is somehow possessed by Satan and not doing the dishes. And that's how Satan's like, dirty dishes, that's how I'm going to get them. Like, that's not, that's not what he is communicating in this moment. What this is saying is that, so the dirty dishes happen, and then there's the frustration, and then the enemy steps in to take advantage of that situation. So here's something that you can write down that I wrote down. Demons take advantage of situations to cause further separation. That's how I think this works. Often, demons take advantage of situations to cause further separation from others and from God. Now let's take it to really personal, deep stuff, man. Like there's some of us that have been through abuse and, and man, the, you, you have like a trauma response in your life because of the screaming and the yelling that you heard towards you growing up. You have someone that really, really wronged you. And no one's going to say that that's okay. 
And you have this, this, this anger that's almost like this defense mechanism that's built up. And what I'm trying to say, if you hold on to that bitterness, then what you are doing is you are inviting a spiritual stronghold into your life. And the enemy wants nothing more than to have you in that way, to keep you from the freedom of Jesus. So instead of getting them back, God's saying, would you give it to me and trust me? And we've talked about forgiveness a lot here, but that's what this passage is trying to get at. And then, and then you can start to be the agent of good in this world. You can start to be ready to fight back in this world. So how is it that we fight back? And we're gonna talk about specific ways over the rest of this series, but how do we fight back? It's one sentence, but I think it's worth, it, worth you, all of us getting and understanding. We fight back by choosing to be people of healing in a world of hurt as we live for Jesus and point others to him. This is how we fight back. And God starts to do amazing things. A few years ago, I was jogging at um, Urbanovsky Park on Texas Tech campus. And as I was jogging, I started to sense this weight, which isn't completely like not normal for me because I'm like, yeah, you've been eating a lot of burgers, so kind of part of it. But, uh, but no, I, f- I felt this, this weight that I would describe as this, it was this spiritual weight that I had never felt before or since. But I was jogging and I had this, it was like this, only the way I can say it is like this vision where I was like zoomed out all of a sudden. And I, as I was jogging in my mind, I saw all these people across campus all these college students, and it was like this, every single one of them had this dark cloud over them that was pressing down. And in my heart, I knew where it represented just the, the brokenness and the weight and the sin and the places that we call, that we're gonna run into freedom and pleasure, not knowing that it's a prison. And man, all, all of this stuff that was just, just being pushed down on college students and just going through them. And I, I stopped running right there. I, got, I sat at a bench and I started crying uh, to Jesus. I'm sure it looked really weird to anybody walking by, but I was crying to Jesus, just saying, Jesus, I, I, j- I want you to show how much more the light is powerful than the darkness over these students. And I've seen it before, but since then, man, I have seen conversation after conversation after conversation where I'll be talking with someone and I'll sense that there's this battle going on that I would say is a spiritual battle. And I'll ask them, do you feel this tug of war going on inside of you right now? And a lot of times they will say, yes, I do, big time. And I'll say, can I tell you what that is? That's a spiritual battle being fought over your life right now. Will you give in to God or will you continue to go after whatever it is that you're going after? But God wants you. Will you, will you just surrender? And man, as I've talked to them, I've started to share the good news of Jesus that right now, right here, Jesus is actually pursuing you, died for you because he loves you, rose from the grave to show that there is victory offered to you if you would say yes. And will you say yes? And when they do, say yes to Jesus. They have talked about how it feels like a weight is lifted off their shoulders. And I say, do you know what that weight lifted off your shoulders is? It's the chains of bondage being broken over your life. And now you can walk in freedom. And maybe you're here and you're like them. And I just want to say what I've said to so many. You right here right now, do you sense a tug of war going on inside you? Can I tell you what that is? It's a spiritual battle being fought over your life. Will you give in to God? And if you do, he will set you free tonight. And when God sets you free, you are free to now stand in your faith. And that's where we're going to end. God sets us free, so now we can stand. Over and over again, it talks about this word stand. It says in verse 11 that we would stand against the schemes. And then in verse 13, that we would be able to withstand in the evil day, to stand firm. And then it says stand, therefore, that we would stand. This word stand, it means to literally be on the balls of your feet, battle ready, prepared for the fight. 
Let me ask us all this question in your life. Are you standing ready to be the agent of healing in a world of hurt as you spread the good news of Jesus? Are you standing or are you sitting in your faith? To stand means that you're battle ready. But a lot of people, man, we just get comfortable in our sin, comfortable in our addiction, comfortable in our hurt, comfortable in the bitterness, comfortable in carrying the generational chains of our family that's been passed down to us. And we say things like, man, it's just the way that I am. And what I'm trying to tell you is no, it can be different from this day forward. Like this day forward, it can be a new chapter that Jesus starts in your life. Jesus says, it might be the way that you were, but because of me, it doesn't have to be the way that you are anymore. I can step in and change everything for you. You can walk in freedom. You can stand. Will you stand? Some of us, man, we've sat in fear for far too long and fear has kept us from being the light that Jesus has called us to be on campus and to our family and to our friends. God set you free so you can stand. Will you stand firm then? And as we stand, just like when my brother showed up, Jesus gives us this newfound confidence as he's with us and he's more powerful than anything that would come against us and he is on our side. Let's pray, God. there's somebody that needs to let go of that bitterness because they've been fighting the wrong fight, help them. If there's somebody that needs to say yes for the first time to you, Jesus, and that you would break that, that chain over their life, would you, would you call them? God, for all of us, help us to stand firm and we be prepared. Thank you that we fight a battle, but the war's won. Amen, Jesus, thank you.